but to make a much more important political point, which will be the theme of the talk today. It's a tongue-in-cheek, you know, it's a rhetorical device, and it's a tongue-in-cheek jab at the rhetorical devices or at the practice of what I have elsewhere written about um, for some time of what I've come to call virtual social science, which, uh, which has developed in the, um, not only in the family wars, but over the last half century, of the family wars over all kinds of issues, single motherhood originally, starting with the Moynihan Report in the mid-1960s, on through the big um, public media conflicts over Murphy Brown in the um, early 1990s, through the emergence of the marriage promotion campaign that is still going really strong and it has had various incarnations, uh, had enormous influence on the um, welfare reform movement and the bill in 1996, which we'll get to later, on the passage of the Defense of Marriage Act, um, both of those in 1996. Um, and it's interesting that it was two Atlantic monthly uh, feature stories that sort of highlight this and led to a certain amount of my own involvement. So one was the feature story, which unfortunately we couldn't get the cover of, so we um, sort of uh, fudged a little bit. Um, in April, I think it was, of um, 1993, uh, the kind of very provocative Barbara uh, Whitehead, Defoe Whitehead story um, that was titled, Dan Quayle Was Right, which was coming right after. Some of you are too young to understand any of this, and you can ask your elders later. But um, anyway, um, but um, was a very provocative article in this supposedly liberal magazine that basically said that, um, you know, the um, Dan Quayle was right that it's better to grow up in a family with your married mother and father, and the assault on Murphy Brown as the symbol of the single mother. On to a very recent one, um, which led to some love letters I've been getting, which is the um, July-August issue of The Atlantic, which was called The End of Men, question mark, and had a short story in it by Pamela Paul that some of you may have seen that was actually about our Journal of Marriage and the Family article from last February. And that, art, that little story, which was supposed to be a lot longer, was called Our Fathers Necessary, so very relevant to our topic today. And as I said, I think that was probably the catalyst, that story, which quoted um, us at length and about from the article and, of course, misunderstood it. Um, sent me a lovely, when I came back from um, four months dancing in Buenos Aires, um, I had found this postcard in my mailbox. I scanned it, you can't read that part. So this is one side, it was addressed to um, Judith Stacy, the um, one of God's greatest mistakes, which I take to be quite high praise. <laughs> and, and so, I had the wrong address at NYU, so it took a while to... Um, reached me and scribbled on the front, as you can see there, was man killer, father killer, child killer, you are a waste of life. Now, I think my son, who is still alive, the last I heard, <laughs> might agree with some of those sentiments, but um, <laughs> the waste of life part, but anyway, <laughs> but I don't think his is one of them. I'm pretty proud. So um, it was pretty unsettling to get that, and I had to really think, what prompted this? I've been out of the country dancing, I don't know. But... Um, <laughs> Then I remembered the Journal of Marriage and Family story, and that's what um, brings us here today. Um, I start this way to make the point that it is um, the family wars, in other words, politics, not science, that was really the backdrop to the two articles that Tim and I wound up doing together. The call for them was quite literally uh, welling up through all of these debates that were out in the public arena. And it's really politics, I think, that made the two articles that we did that don't represent original primary research, but in both cases are very serious, systematic, analytical, and critical reviews of the existing research literature. So it's not, I mean, I used to, I have a Stacy's Law of the inverse relationship between effort and reward. I've gotten infinitely more recognition and readership in life for things that I spent, this, these projects actually were time consuming, but I've sometimes, given a talk that got written up, and more people have read that than a book I worked on for 10 years, you know. So, uh, so th this fit somewhere midway into that. But it was really the political response to these works that led to the amount of conversation and the interest, and I think, therefore, probably um, the invitation to speak to you today. Um, we came to call these t the two articles that um, 
Ramona mentioned, um, across a decade now, one in 2000, 2001, one in 2000, one on the sex orientation of parents, the second on the gender of parents, which are inextricably related. Um, our story, we, we came to call these articles privately uh, Tink 1 and Tink 2 for Tinkerbell, because when we were writing the first one, um, and I'll tell you some of the backstory about that, we uh, began to talk about what we called the Tinkerbell thesis of um, sexual identity, and the same could be true for gender identity. And this would be the idea that there was no reason, that it was utterly arbitrary, or in my um, more ironic mode that maybe a sprite like Tinkerbell would just randomly go about sprinkling her fairy dust on anyone who would turn out to be gay. So, um, the, um, and that was kind of the state of the discourse if you really looked at the research at that point. So, we're going to talk today a little bit about the backdrop, both the political context and the research context, and the consequences in both cases of looking at these kinds of issues when there is so much public controversy about them and so much disagreement, and they matter so much to so many people.